I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Zachary Lansdowne, and I will keep this short. He said the shorter the sweeter because he has a lot to say and <laughs> present to us. So you can read about him in his own biography. I'm just grateful that we have someone here, um, like a number of us in the room, who are bridgers between groups. He's past president of the Theosophical Society, and he has, um, you know, we, uh, donated his brilliant mind to penetrating the teachings and bringing that that uh, reasoning science um, keen awareness uh, into all of it the biblical scriptures the, the theosophical writings Alice Bailey writings all of it so it's it's wonderful to have that kind of perspective so um, I'm just grateful that he's here to give a talk on the Egyptian myth of Isis and Osiris and correlating that with uh, the Alice Bailey teachings the spiritual journey and he was going to do this for a workshop, and I said, oh, please, I want to hear this. So <laughs> um, he agreed. So thank you, and help me welcome Dr. Zachary Lansdowne. So my mic is on. Super. Um, figure this out here. The ancient Egyptian myth of Isis and Osiris appears to be a dramatic tale of betrayal and revenge. Isis is the wife of Osiris, king of Egypt. Osiris is killed by his brother Typhon, also called Seth. Horus, who is the son of Isis and Osiris, later fights with and defeats Typhon. The myth, however, has a hidden or esoteric meaning. The purpose of this lecture will be to show that its hidden meaning is an account of the spiritual journey similar to that given by Alice Bailey. This myth um, is about 3,500 years uh, old, and it has three main segments. First, after Typhon seals Osiris in a chest and throws it in a river, Isis searches for and eventually recovers the chest. Second, after Typhon cuts up Osiris' body into multiple parts, Isis searches for those parts and eventually finds them. Third, Horus struggles with Typhon for the right to rule the kingdom and eventually defeats him. Uh, my two sources for the myth are as follows. There's the essay on Isis and Osiris, which was composed by the uh, famous Greek philosopher and historian Plutarch about 2,000 years ago. And then um, there is an even uh, older thing called the 80 Years of Contention Between Horus and Seth. This is a 12th century BC papyrus manuscript and I'm using the English translation from the um, theology website. So I'm using Plutarch's account for the first two segments of the myth, then I'm using this uh, papyrus manuscript for the um, third segment. According to Bailey, the spiritual journey consists of a series of milestones called initiations that define discrete segments of the journey. So the first segment, called the path probation, extends from the beginning to the first initiation. The second segment extends from the first initiation to the second initiation, and the third segment extends from the second initiation to the third initiation. Um, I'm going to try to argue uh, this remarkable observation that each segment of the myth symbolically depicts the corresponding segment of the spiritual journey. Uh, uh, my basic approach interpreting the myth is to take each aspect, or to take each symbol as representing some aspect of an aspirant on the spiritual journey. So let's look at the meaning of uh, the three key characters. I take Osiris as symbolizing the soul. Uh, Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society, made a, a, a similar um, uh, correspondence. She writes, Osiris is the indwell indwelling spirit. Bailey herself says that Isis symbolizes the personality. And then finally, I take Typhon as symbolizing illusion because Bavosky speaks of the identity of Satan with the Egyptian Typhon, and the original Hebrew word for Satan means adversary, and I take the adversary to be the adversary we have to defeat on the spiritual journey, which actually is illusion. Now, the way... Um, my slides are organized is as follows. Um, the top of the slide in bold is the actual text of the myth, in this case from Plutarch's account. 
The middle part, part of the slide, which is in italics, is my interpretation of the text. And then the bottom of the slide uh, gives quotations from Bailey, which help to uh, clarify some of the symbols. So let's proceed. Typhon, having secretly measured Osiris's body and having made ready a beautiful chest of corresponding size artistically ornamented, caused it to be brought into the room where the festivity was in progress. Osiris got into it and lay down, and those who were in the plot ran to it and slammed down the lid, which they fastened by nails from the outside and also by using molten lead. Then they carried the chest to the river and sent it on, on its way to the sea. So what we see is that Typhon, which symbolizes illusion, buries Osiris, which symbolizes um, the soul, in a tomb that is artistically ornamented and sent into the sea. Bailey writes, water is the symbol of the emotional nature. So my interpretation here is that illusion buries the soul in a tomb of sensations and, and emotions. It turns out Bailey uses the, uh, a very similar metaphor when she writes, the eternal immortal soul in every man must rise from the tomb of matter. So both the myth and Bailey say that our souls are in a tomb at the beginning of the spiritual journey. Isis, when the tidings reached her, at once cut off one of her tresses and put on a garment of mourning in a place where the city still bears the name of Copto. Copto is the Greek verb that means to lament or mourn. And um, let's see here. At this stage of the spiritual journey, the aspirant works through the personality. So Isis symbolizes um, the aspirant as well as the personality. And, and so here's the interpretation. The aspirant, when sensing this inner imprisonment, feels a loss of contentment and satisfaction. It turns out that Bailey uh, describes the, the beginning of the spiritual journey in a similar way when she writes, there slowly arises in him a divine discontent. The savor of his life experience and enterprises begins to prove unsatisfactory. Isis wandered everywhere at her wit's end. No one whom she approached did she fail to address, and even when she met some little children, she asked them about the chest. As it happened, they had seen it, and they told her the mouth of the river through which the friends of Typhon had launched the coffin into the sea. Um, little children symbolize people, not necessarily young, who have made spiritual progress, and the same symbol is actually used in the New Testament. So here's the interpretation. The aspirant runs from teacher to teacher before finding someone who can give genuine help, and Bailey uh, gives a similar description of this, uh, of this stage of the path when she writes, the first stage, therefore, in the training of such an, a, an aspirant is to relate him to a more advanced disciple who will lead him gradually onward and give him the help he needs. The aspirant at this stage runs from one teacher to another according to inclination, opportunity, and necessity. Here we're pausing to just review some terminology from um, uh, theosophy and, and Hinduism. Uh, according to theosophy, the physical body of a human being consists of two parts. There's the dense physical part and there's the etheric body. The etheric body uh, is composed of um, a web or mesh of energy nadis, and these nadis form seven centers of energies, called, sometimes called chakras, and five of these chakras are in the spinal column. So let's go back to the myth. Thereafter, Isis, as they relate, learned that the chest had been cast up by the sea near the land of Byblos, and that the waves had gently set it down in the midst of a clump of heather. The heather in a short time ran up into a very beautiful and massive stalk. It unfolded and embraced the chest with its growth and concealed it within its trunk. The king of the country admired the great size of the plant and cut off the portion that enfolded the chest which was now hidden from sight, and used it as a pillar to support the roof of the house. So if we take the king's house to be the dense physical body, the pillar to be the spinal column, the heather to be the nadis, 
and the chest to be the uh, center or chakra, we have the following interpretation. The aspirant learns that the soul can be found in an energy center or chakra formed by nadis and located in the spinal column supporting the dense physical body. These facts, they say, Isis is ascertained by the divine inspiration of rumor and came to Byblos and sat down by a spring. This passage depicts three key disciplines that Bailey says an aspirant needs to perform prior to the first initiation. Divine inspiration indicates higher sensitivity. Byblos, where writing uh, is said to be invented according to Egyptian mythology, symbolizes the mind. And we've already discussed how water symbolizes emotions, but in the, um, the Old Testament, a spring or fountain represents the higher or heart emotions. So here's the interpretation. The aspirant develops sensitivity to divine inspiration, shifts from emotional to mental orientation, and, cul and cultivates higher emotions such as love. Then the goddess disclosed herself and asked for the pillar which served to support the roof. She removed it with the greatest ease and cut away the, wo the wood of the heather which surrounded the chest. She opened the chest and laid her face upon the face within and crested and wept. So the interpretation is, the aspirant finds the soul in the heart center, formed by nadis and located in the spinal column supporting the dense physical body. Let's examine how Bailey characterizes the first initiation. She writes, Christ or soul is, is to be found in the cave of the heart. And then she says the first initiation, the birth of the Christ in the cave of the heart. So um, we see then that Isis finding uh, Osiris, the soul, in the, uh, the heart chakra it depicts this uh, particular way that uh, Bailey characterizes the first initiation. Bailey also says, at the first initiation, the personality of the initiate and the, and the hovering, overshadowing soul are consciously brought together. And this corresponds to um, Isis um, laying her face upon the face within and caressing it and weeping. We're now moving to the second segment of the, of the myth. And this is still based on um, Plutarch's account. Typhon, who was hunting by night in the light of the moon, happened upon it, referring to Osiris's chest. Recognizing the body, he divided into 14 parts and scattered them each in a different place. Now, Bailey uses lunar orb or moon to symbolize the solar plexus chakra, so light of the moon symbolizes the lower emotions. Osiris's body is divided into 14 fragments, which consists of seven pairs. And this can be taken as depicting the full set of pairs of opposites, because the number seven is often used to symbolize completeness. So here's the interpretation. Illusion acting through the lower emotions causes the one soul to be perceived as differentiated and separated, separated into many material forms and pairs of opposites. Bailey makes a similar point when she writes, Yet all forms are differentiations of the soul, but that soul is one soul when viewed and considered spiritually. When studied from the form side, not but differentiation and separation can be seen. Isis learned of this and sought for them, referring to the parts of Osiris's body, sailing through the swamps in a boat of papyrus. Papyrus was used for writing, so it depicts the mind. Uh, and Water is a symbol of the emotional nature. So after observing these emotional reactions, the aspirant searches for the one soul in all forms, shifting consciousness from the emotional to mental body. This is the reason why people sailing in such boats are not harmed by the crocodiles, since these creatures in their own way show either their fear or their reverence for the goddess. Crocodiles live in swamps, so they symbolize glamours. So this is the interpretation. This is the reason why people who are polarized within their mental body are not harmed by glamours, since their emotional body becomes quiescent and receptive. Bailey makes a similar point when she writes, 
The emotional body should be controlled from the mental plane, and when polarization has been transferred into the mental body, then the emotional becomes quiescent and receptive. The traditional result of Osiris's dismemberment is that there are many so-called tombs of, Os of Osiris in Egypt, for Isis held a funeral for each part when she found it. The many tombs symbolizes the death of many glamours. So the usual result of the soul's differentiation is that there are many deaths of glamour in the aspirant's life, for the aspirant brings about the death of each glamour found to block his or her perception of the soul. So according to the myth, we make progress towards the second initiation by bringing death to one glamour after another, the most apparent a glamour first, then subtle glamours. Of the parts of Osiris's body, the only one which Isis did not find was the male member, which is the phallus, for the reason that this had not been at once tossed into the river and the lepidotus, the sea bream and the pike had fed upon it. The phallus is the organ of creation in the male body, so it symbolizes the creative aspect of the soul called the light of the soul. Sea symbolizes the emotional body, so sea animals symbolize emotional reactions. So here's the meaning. The aspirant's waking consciousness is not illumined by the light of the soul for the reason that emotional reactions have blocked it. Bailey makes the same, uh, a similar point. She speaks of the forms which desire, emotion, and so forth prevent the light of the soul from illuminating the waking consciousness. So you see the aspirant at this stage has, has the following difficulty. Um, his or her task is to uh, overcome a series of glamours, but to do that, the aspirant needs to draw upon the light of the soul, but those very glamours prevent the light of the soul from entering the waking consciousness. So what can the aspirant do? But Isis made a replica of the member to take its place and consecrated the phallus in honor of which the Egyptians, even at the present day, celebrate a festival. Um, this passage depicts a meditation exercise. But the aspirant uses the imagination to visualize the light of the soul, acts as if the visualized image were in fact the light of the soul, and regularly repeats this effort. For this stage of the path, Bailey describes the same approach to meditation. She, she writes, in the early stages of his invocative work, that is, invoking the light of the soul, the instrument used is the creative imagination. This enables him at the very beginning to act as if he were capable of thus creating. Once it, referring to Osiris's body, was all together, the body was wrapped in white linen and placed in state at the temple of Abydos. Osiris's reassembled body depicts the realization of omnipresence, which is the realization of the one soul that lies behind, behind all differentiation of form. Abydos symbolizes the causal body because the, the original Egyptian name for Abydos signifies a, a container for holy, holy relics. And Bailey writes, the content of the causal body is the accumulation by slow and gradual process of the good in each life. So the causal body is actually a container of holy relics. So here's the interpretation. The realization of omnipresence occurs within consciousness polarized in the causal body. Bailey makes a similar statement when she writes, it is by meditation or the reaching from the concrete to the abstract. Now, the realization of omnipresence is the realization of an abstract principle, and she uh, associates that with the entering of causal consciousness and causal consciousness means shifting the polarization of consciousness into the causal body. Let's examine how Bailey characterizes the second initiation. The first paragraph gives the definition of omnipresence and uses the term omnipresence, but doesn't actually mention the second initiation. The second paragraph mentions the second initiation but not the term omnipresence, but it, it relates the second initiation to the definition of omnipresence. So if we take these two paragraphs together, it appears that Bailey is associating the second initiation with the realization of omnipresence. 
The other way that Bailey characterizes the second initiation is that she says that it marks the completion of the process whereby the emotional nature is brought under soul control. If you think about it, if we have, uh, if we have reached causal consciousness and are experiencing the realization of omnipresence, we're no longer going to be involved in separative emotional reactions. And so, you know, that's emotional control right there. But I should say that these um, characterizations that the uh, aspirant achieves, achieves at the second initiation, omnipresence, um, emotional control, should be thought of as peak experiences because the next moment the aspirant may lose them. And it's the task, as we will see, uh, of the path from the second initiation to the third initiation to make these experiences continuous over time. So now we're going to begin the, uh, the third and final segment of the myth. And now we're shifting away from Plutarch to the account given by the Egyptian papyrus manuscript. And we have a new setup with new, new characters. Horus, the avenger of Osiris, came before the great Ennead. With his mother beside him, he spoke of the cruel murder of his father at the hands of Seth. He spoke of the usurpation of the throne of Egypt. The gods were impressed by the eloquence of the falcon-headed one, and they pitied him. Horus, um, I say, signifies causal consciousness for, for uh, several reasons. First, the causal body is the product of the soul, Osiris, and the personality, Isis. And it turns out the wings of falcons are shaped like a scythe, and, uh, and indicating that causal consciousness can cut through to the essence of things. Seth is the Egyptian name um, of the same god, uh, and Typhon is the, is the Greek name. And um, I take Seth as symbolizing what Bailey calls personality consciousness. So Bailey writes, you will learn that things which are potent and, and apparent in your personality consciousness are in fact non-existent. So Bailey uh, is associating illusion with personality consciousness. Finally, the great Ennead, which consists of a panel of nine gods, I take as symbolizing the aspirant. So here's the interpretation. The aspirant chooses between the competing claims of causal and personality consciousness. And you'll see how this works in the, um, the next slides. Shu, son of the creator, was the first to speak. Right should rule might. Mighty Seth has force on his side, but young Horus has justice. We shall do justice unto Horus by proclaiming, yes, ye shall have the throne of thy father. Shu is a member of the panel of gods and so represents the aspirant. And so um, the aspirant, believing that right should rule might, emerges out of personality consciousness into causal consciousness. Now it turns out Bailey makes a similar statement, uh, and that's given in the middle of the slide there. She writes, from these forms, and it, the context of this quotation shows that the word form signifies glamours. So from these glamours, the individual aspirant has ever to rid himself, emerging after so doing. Remember, uh, according to the myth, that we make progress towards the second initiation by overcoming our glamours. So emerging after so doing through the gate, which we call the second initiation, into a wider consciousness. The wider consciousness is, refers to causal consciousness. So um, both the myth and Bailey indicate that the aspirin emerges into causal consciousness immediately after the second initiation. Isis gave a great cry of joy. She begged the north wind to change the direction westward to whisper the news unto Osiris. So, causal consciousness enables the personality to be joyful and have a channel of communication with the soul. Um, thus, we see that causal consciousness offers two advantages to the aspirant, joy and a channel of communication with the soul. According to the myth, however, the aspirant doesn't stay in causal consciousness, but chooses to return to personality consciousness because of the latter's attractions. What are those attractions? And to this Seth proclaimed, it is I who slay the enemy of Ray Daly. 
It is I who stand in the prow, prow of the bark of millions of years, and no other god can do it. It is I who should receive the office of Osiris. So, in response to this choice of causal consciousness, personality consciousness tempts the aspirant by offering feelings of being more special than other people. Uh, the Course in Miracles makes this comment. It is essential to the preservation of the ego, or personality consciousness, that you believe the specialness is not hell, but heaven. <laughs> the gods knew the terrors of the serpents of chaos. They muttered that Seth was right. So the aspirant wants to defend against his or her own terrors, and so returns to personality consciousness. A Course in Miracles asks, who would defend himself unless he thought he were attacked, that the attack were real, and that his own defense could save him? And herein lies the folly of defense. It gives illusions full reality and then, it, then attempts to handle them as real. It adds illusions to illusions, thus making correction doubly difficult. And it is this you do when you attempt to plan the future, activate the past, or organize the present as you wish. So personality consciousness offers two attractions. It enables us to feel special and to defend ourselves against our terrors. Because of these attractions, the aspirant chooses to return to personality consciousness. Isis became furious at the Ennead for not speaking in favor of her son. She complained to them until, for the sake of peace, they promised that justice should be given unto Horus. When we have personality consciousness, we have wrong identification. So Bailey says, wrong identification is the cause of pain and leads to suffering, distress, and various effects. So after a while, while in personality consciousness, the, um, the personality is suffering. That's why we, we need to look for entertainment. We need to have loud music. We have to distract ourselves. And so the personality becomes dis discontented with its suffering, wanting joy and peace instead of pain and distress. Eventually, the aspirant responds by deciding to return to causal consciousness, or, or we might go to a meditation group or something like that. Mighty Seth was angered. How dare ye cowards break thine oath? I shall fetch my great scepter and strike one of you down with it each day. I swear I will not, ar I will not argue my case in any court where Isis is present. So, personality consciousness tries to preserve itself when it is threatened, threatens to take away the aspirant's power if it's abandoned, and tries to suppress those parts of the personality that threaten it. The point here, I think, is that the aspirant doesn't think that causal consciousness can be effective in producing results in the physical plane. The aspirant may think of causal consciousness as something that can be, that's good for um, contemplating abstract things, but if you really want to get things done in, in the physical world, you have to use the methods of personality consciousness. You have to, for example, use anger to motivate people, um, use threats to gain people's uh, cooperation, um, perhaps use what might be called noble eyes, um, you know, all for the greater good. And so um, uh, the, the aspirant is thinking that as, as long as the, um, he or she is remaining in, in causal consciousness, the aspirant is losing uh, the ability to operate effectively in the material world. So, um, according to the, uh, to the myth, neither causal nor personality consciousness is stable because when the aspirant is in one state, um, he or she is attracted to the other state. And so the aspirant starts cycling back and forth. And it's only that we arrive at this particular slide that the aspirant is actually going to start making progress towards the third initiation. So Ray proclaimed, we shall cross the river to the island in the midst and try the case thereon. I shall further order the ferryman not to ferry Isis across. Ray is a member of the panel of gods and so represents the aspirant. So the aspirant examines, 
the attractiveness of personality consciousness while being detached from the personality. Bailey gives similar advice. She writes, you would find it of value to discover where your extensions are and then retreat inward to the point of tension from which you can consciously and effectively direct soul energy. So we're, uh, at this point, the, the uh, aspirant is finding that his or her consciousness is constantly being pulled out. And what the aspirant needs to do is to examine exactly what is pulling his consciousness out and trying to see objectively what, what those attractions are. Now, at this point in the myth, um, we would expect to get an insight into the nature of personality consciousness. But what we actually do is get a very long story. So let's um, consider that story. Isis, now appearing as a beautiful young woman, approached the Lord of Storm. Who art thou, my pretty, asked Seth, and why hast thou come here? Isis hid her face and wept. O oh, great Lord, I'm looking for a champion. I was the wife of a herdsman, and I bore for him a son. Then my dear husband died, and the boy began to tend his father's cattle. But lo, a stranger came and ceased our buyer, and told my son that he would take our cattle and turn us out. My son wished to protest, but the stranger threatened to beat him. Great Lord, help me. Be my son's champion. Seth heard her words and dried her tears. Do not cry, my pretty, I shall be your champion and destroy this villain. How dare a stranger take the, the father's property while the son is still alive? Great Isis shrieked with laughter. Cry thyself, mighty Seth. Ye have condemned thyself. Thou hast judged thine own case. There are thine own case. What I get from the story is that condemnation of another brings about self-condemnation. Seth was angered unto tears of rage. The gods demanded to know what had transpired. He told them of how he had been tricked by the cunning lady Isis. Ray said unto the dark god, It is true, Seth, thou hast judged thyself. So, the aspirant recognizes a key illusion of personality consciousness, the belief that one can judge other people without harming oneself. And this turns out to be a universal belief. Um, all of us, I think it's somewhere along the line, have believed that by degrading other people in our minds, by judging them, by um, collecting grievances and resentments, that somehow we are enhancing our own self-image and therefore are being happy. But when the uh, aspirant recognizes that the, the belief that one can judge other people without harming oneself is an illusion, that actually frees the aspirant from much of the, attraction, the attractions of personality consciousness. Horus made this, his complaint against Seth. It is now 80 years we are in the court, but they do not know how to judge among us. I have contended with him in the hall of the way of truth. I was found right against him. I have contended with him in the hall of the horned Horus, and, and so forth. So causal consciousness realizes that it has dealt with certain aspects of life more effectively than personality consciousness would have. This is a surprising discovery for the aspirant because the aspirant didn't really think that causal consciousness was actually effective in dealing with the issues of life. But the aspirant finds not only that causal consciousness is effective, but it's actually more effective than personality consciousness because causal consciousness can bring down the um, wisdom and the guidance of the soul. In the trial, Ray Atom asked this important question. What shall we do about these two gods who for 80 years now have been, been before the tribunal? Geb, lord of the gods, commanded the nine gods to gather to him. He judged between Horus and Seth. He entered their great quarrel. He made Seth as king of southern Egypt, and Geb made Horus king of Egypt in, in the land of northern Egypt. Thus Horus stood over one region, and Seth stood over one region. So, the aspirant decides to compromise, rely on personality consciousness for some areas, and rely on causal consciousness for other areas. A Course in Miracles explains, you must choose between total freedom and total bondage, for there are no alternatives but these. You have tried many compromises in the attempt to avoid recognizing the one decision you must make. And yet it is the recognition of the decision, just as it is, 
that makes the decision so easy. But the aspirant wants to compromise. And so typically, uh, the aspirant uh, decides on using personality consciousness for those areas that the aspirant thinks are more important, and then uses causal consciousness for the areas that, from the aspirant's point of view, isn't that important. That's the compromise. Then Horace spake and said, it is not good to defraud me before the Ennead and take the office of my father Osiris from me. So causal consciousness recognizes that reliance on personal consciousness for some areas is not a good outcome from the aspirant because it limits the guidance of the soul. Uh, let's see what we're doing here. So the aspirant faces an inner conflict between, on the one hand, wanting to compromise, but recognizing that compromise is not a good outcome. How can this conflict be resolved? Shu and Thoth persuaded the court to send a letter to Osiris. After a time, the messenger returned. Osiris demanded to know why his son had been robbed of the throne. He demanded to know if the gods had forgotten that it was he, Osiris, who had given the world the precious gifts of barley and wheat. So the aspirant attempts to resolve the inner conflict by seeking guidance from the soul, which responds by telling the aspirant to examine why he or she still wants personality consciousness and by reminding the aspirant that it has already proven itself by giving many gifts. Geb's words to the nine gods, I have appointed Horus, the firstborn, him alone, Horus, the inheritance. So the aspirant makes the decision to rely on causal consciousness for all areas of his or her life. Um, I have this quote from Bailey. She says, between the second and third initiations, the disciple has to demonstrate a continuity of non-response to astralism and emotionalism. That corresponds to being in causal consciousness. So the aspirant chooses causal consciousness without compromise. That, that's, that's the key step. Then Horus stood over the land. He is the uniter of this land, proclaimed in the great name Totenum, south of his wall, Lord of Eternity. This um, has some new symbols up there, and the way I interpret it, I'm going through this fast. Causal consciousness takes control over all areas of the aspirant's life and unites those areas, realizing that its nature is divine, life itself, and eternal. Let's examine how Bailey characterizes the third initiation. Um, she characterizes it, uh, first of all, by saying it's freedom from the ancient authority of the threefold personality and also the elimination of the thought form of the personality. This corresponds to Horus defeating Seth and ruling all of Egypt. The second way that Bailey characterizes the third initiation is by writing, complete light and illumination is the right of the disciple who attains to the third initiation. And um, this corresponds to Horus receiving the proclamation, uh, where he is proclaimed in the great name, Totenum, south of his wall, and Lord of Eternity. Because the, the myth of Isis and Osiris is the best known myth from the Egyptian religion, many previous attempts have been made to explain its significance. This lecture shows that this ancient myth can be interpreted as a symbolic depiction of Bailey's modern account of the spiritual journey. And uh, to bring us to the theme of the conference, you know, uh, Fifth Ray of Science, um, I could also say that the, uh, one of the things that this lecture has done is provide um, empirical evidence for a uh, claim that um, both Blavatsky and Bailey make, namely that modern theosophy is just a contemporary expression of the um, esoteric teachings or the ageless wisdom once known in ancient times. And so, um, uh, whereas that is, um, you can think of that as like a revealed um, truth that Blavatsky and Bailey, uh, you know, just stated. But what, among other things, uh, you can think of this lecture as providing empirical, that is, scientific evidence to support that, that particular claim. 
Uh, for more information, um, th this lecture was based on an article published in the Esoteric Quarterly about four years ago. And um, the Esoteric Quarterly is a free online journal. And copies of this uh, article are actually available for sale in the bookstore. Um, do we have any, uh, do I have any time left? I don't think so. Four minutes. Four minutes. So uh, questions for four minutes. Okay, well then we can quit early, okay. I just want to say, uh, Zach, not exactly a question, but that was kind of a breathtaking journey. So, I, I a lot of us, a lot of us were st well, no, not not so much the speed, but it's just the the scope of it and then the combining both the myth story, which I didn't know very much about, but also beautiful recounting of of, of the Bailey teachings. It was uh, stunning. So, thank you very much for that. I'm still holding my breath here. I don't know. It's, uh, okay. I'd love to see that again with with some of the pictures. There's so much imagery that the Egyptian uh, you know, mythology has. It'd be great to combine that. Do you think you could do that next time? <laughs> <laughs> I want to take this thing off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was brilliant. I really appreciate it. That was really good for us to experience this, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Very, very good. Really good. Because I, I know there's so, there's so much um, interest in the Egyptian mythology, and, and it's so... You know, unless you take the time to, to really penetrate it and, and connect these things, um, you know, it's a life study. So it was wonderful. Thank you so much.